Welcome to Money Making Conversation. I'm your host, Rashawn McDonald. It's time to stop reading other people's success stories and really, and start writing your own. I tell you that every time you listen to this show or watch it. Now, you can be motivated by their success because their stories can offer you direction and help you reach your goals. But remember, it's their stories and it's their goals. Now, you have to start planning your story and your goals, and you're only going to get there through your committed effort. My interviews that I bring on Money Making Conversations... Uh, celebrities, CEOs, entrepreneurs, and industry decision makers. These are different types of people that you're meeting in this business, and these type of people influence the way we, from pop culture to sports to finances, are tied to those four categories that I deem important on Money Making Conversation. My next guest is Bevy Smith. She is an author, pop culture aficionado, fashion expert, and host of Bevelations on Sears XM's radio, Andy. Bevy just released her first book, Bevelations. Bevelations is her memoir about learning to live a big, authentic and unapologetic life and how you can do it too. Once a while a successful luxury fashion pu- publication executive at Rolling Stone and Vibe magazine, she shifted. Now I have I can relate to that because I did some shifting that we're going to discuss because a lot of things in her book I related to. And she shifted her professional goals over a decade ago to pursue a life in front of the camera. Bevy served as a moderator on Bravo TV's revolutionary talk show, Fashion Queens, and was a co-host on the nationally syndicated entertainment news program, Page Six TV. Please welcome the Money Making Conversation for the very first time, but not the last time, Miss Bevy Smith. How you doing? <laughs> Hello, my love. I'm so happy to be here with you. Well, I, 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 I you know, like, I mean, we'll talk about the book, but there's a lot going on in your life, you know, mm-hmm. and it's by design. I, I, I took it with my reading from the book that every move you made was not something that just kind of happened. It happened because you sought it out, you planned it, and, 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 and it worked to your favor. And that's what the book really is about, planning your destiny and choosing your path, correct? It is. It is. You know, I'm from Harlem. And so a lot of times when people hear my story, they they say, oh, my gosh, you're such a hustler. And I always tell them I'm not a hustler. I'm a strategist Mm -hmm. because a hustler will do anything to make their money. You know, the end goal for them is always about the green, the money. Right. And for me, it's always about satisfaction, pride Mm -hmm. in my work. Um, And I'm also not going to take things that don't resonate with me. I'm not going to ever take a job that just really doesn't connect with me. Right. Um, it's just not worth it. I've been offered a myriad of times to be a part of a reality TV right. uh, show <laughs> once or twice in my life. And um, I've always said no, because that just doesn't fit in. So yeah, I do believe that it's important. It's imperative to have a plan for your life, to have a strategy for your life and not just allow things to just kind of happen. But while at the same time being open to the journey. Well, you know, the journey is really important that we want to talk about your book, Revelations. And you have Revelations in it, a little, little uh, I call it little, little um, statements of information that would allow you to move your life forward in a positive direction with planning. And that's what I took away from the book. And it's a long book now, but a good read because it talks about your life and childhood. It talks about your parents, talk about your older brother, your your, your sister who's a, a nerd, your older brother who's gay, and, uh, and your father who uh, worked at a copper refinery pack factory and your mom who was uh, cleaned homes but didn't want to like you said in the book you know let me not let you think your mama was working for, or like the people in the help your mama had fashion your mama had personality and that's yes. where you got your personality from from your mom correct indeed i got my um my fashion sensibility and my outgoing personality from my mom my mom is still at this age of 93 one of the most fashionable people that i know and um it's been a great honor to be her daughter, along with my daddy, Gus Lee Smith. I say his name in every interview. So, um, yes, it's been an honor to be their daughter. Well, you know, I, I know that I, I was fortunate. Uh, I grew up in Fifth Ward, Texas. And this was just like a, the hood, as they would say, inner city in uh, Houston, Texas. And um, I had both my parents. My father was a truck driver. My mom was a high school. I had received a high school education. Six sisters, two brothers. My family was a little bit bigger than yours. Yeah. But the family was important to me because it shaped me. And I felt that in reading your book, you constantly talk about how your family shaped you. Mm-hmm. Yes, definitely. You know, um, my parents gave us a really incredible work ethic. They also, um, even though they were from Jim Crow South, they were not enamored by white people. Mm -hmm. They never felt like we needed to compare ourselves to white people to see our excellence. Mm -hmm. So I never got that traditional speech that a lot of black people get, which is you have to be 10 times better than a white person Mm -hmm. to get, you know, half as much. 
I never got that message in my home. And although I understand why many people give their kids that message, um, I'm so glad I didn't get that message because then when I went into all white um, environments for work, you know, everything I've ever done really has been primarily a white world. Advertising is incredibly white unless mm-hmm. you work in multicultural. Fashion is incredibly white, especially when you're talking about the luxury fashion category. Right. You know, TV is incredibly white. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so I've always gone into these environments, but because I didn't have that hanging over my head that I needed to show white people that I was just as good, if mm-hmm. not better. Um, I was able to go into experiences and just do my work and do the good work, which is how my parents raised us to do. And then for my sister, she was the one who gave me a lot of my um, black uh, kind of intelligentsia Mm -hmm. information. She's the one who told me all about the Harlem Renaissance and and why the community that we were living in was so great. And it was it had such a legacy. And therefore, because I was living there and walking on the same streets as Baldwin, as Zora Neale Hurston, Mm -hmm. as Langston Hughes, Mm -hmm. as A. Philip Randolph, Mm -hmm. Adam Clayton Powell Jr. I mean, the list goes on and on because I was walking on those same streets because I was attending schools that had their names on the building. I had a legacy as well and that I could be black excellence. And then my brother gave me my love of art. Um, my brother was, uh, as you mentioned, he's gay, mm-hmm. and he gave me a passion about art, dance, like the creative arts, just overall. Well, you know the fun part about it. Okay, you know, let's go astrology. I'm Pisces. You know, you Scorpio. Oh, I'm Scorpio. Come on, you know I know that. Come on, I, I wouldn't bring oh. up Pisces if I didn't Scorpio. You know, we romantic. You know, poetic. <laughs> we have a sense of will together. You know, we can yes. be dating. Okay, well, happy talking. almost birthday. When is your birthday? Uh, February twenty seventh. Mm-hmm. Coming oh, up. Coming up. <laughs> yes. Happy birthday, my love. And then, and then I, I can I can respect. That's why I love this book. Okay, any book that quotes lyrics from Teddy Pendergrass. I'm telling <laughs> you, you, you my girl there. You my girl right there. Yeah. And the book was so much fun. It was so honest. It was so you know. Uh, well, I say honest because you willing to tell us when you made a mistake. You willing to open up about your personal life from your from your siblings to your parents to your lifestyle. At what point in the book do you went, wow, I am telling a lot. Did, did it ever cross your mind? You know, I felt that it was a really um, freeing experience to be able to tell my story in this way and to tell it in an authentic manner. Um, because, you know, Richard, I'm actually moving on. Right. You know, this is another chapter that I'm embarking upon. Mm-hmm. My book is literally my book, Revelations, Lessons mm-hmm. from a Mother, Auntie Bestie. There you go. It's a culmination of 15 years of work. Mm-hmm. When I left Rolling Stone magazine to now, and that's 15 years of attempting to be a part of this industry, be a television host, become a writer, and all those things. And I did it. And now I'm on to the next. And I knew that this book, if I was honest in this book, this book would actually be a catalyst for that change and for that next chapter in my life. So well, I had no, no hesitation about being very honest and authentic. No, I, let me share some things that I, I related to. OK, um, you know, uh, first of all, the name change. You know, Bevy. My name is Rashawn publicly now. My I'm a junior. My father's actual name is Russian McDonald, mm. and so and it, it got to a, it got to a point in my life where I I needed to find my identity. What was my voice? Because I went through some of the same middle school and high school challenges you were through, trying to find your voice, maybe running with the wrong crowd, and and, and defining yourself. And so I remember I was in college when I changed my name, and so mm. when I left school in the spring, I I was Russian. I came back to school in the fall. I was Rashawn, and I was correcting people. I was saying, hey, my name's Rashawn. And they, and then, of course, my everybody from high school, you ain't no Rashawn, you Russian, whatever. <laughs> but you eventually going to be saying Rashawn. I used to tell them that all the time. I said, I said you eventually going to be saying Rashawn one day. Yes. And, yes. and, and, that, and, that, and I, I related to that because, you know, when you make a decision to say this is who I am, that's a powerful statement. And I yes. know because I experienced it. And sometimes you people make you try to you know, try to browbeat you, try to bully you, just and try to define who they think you are, and that's why the name change for you was very important. Tell us about that. Yeah, um, and I love that story with Sean because it is very similar. I was um, at the height of my advertising fashion career. Mm-hmm. I was thirty three years old, mm-hmm. 
Um, I had just arrived in Milan. I was surrounded by gifts from Gucci and Prada and, <laughs> and all the big Italian luxury brands. Uh-huh. I had, you know, just gotten out of my luxury Mercedes sedan with my driver, mm-hmm. Giovanni. Yes. I mean, it was quite fabulous. <laughs> and I went to, you know, my regular hotel suite in Milan at the fanciest, uh, you know, five star hotel in Milan. And I'm a black girl from Harlem, mm-hmm. 150th Street and 8th Avenue. Mm-hmm. So clearly, this is, I've come a long way from the block, right? And um, when I arrived, this is probably like, you know, maybe my, I don't know, 20th, 30th time doing that, right? Because I've been in the business for a minute and I've been living this kind of lifestyle for a while. And when I, when I got into that hotel room and when the bellman left, I collapsed onto the sheets and I was like, this cannot be my life. I realized I was miserable and I was um, dissatisfied and I just felt like there was a hole in my spirit. And I said, how can I change my life? And I did not really have an answer. But I sat down and I wrote out the things that made me feel bad about myself and about my life. I realized that I was working in a career of fashion that really does prey on women's insecurities. And, um, you know, and also it was a tough position for me because I was working in luxury and there weren't a lot of black people in the space. So I was always having to show up and kind of, um, be a representative for my entire culture. Mm -hmm. And for a while I took a lot of pride in that, but then it just became exhausting. Um, And there were lots of other things. And I wrote these things down and I said, well, what can I do about it? Now, clearly if I'm I'm from 150th street and 8th Avenue from Harlem in the hood, I'm not going to up and jump my, uh, you know, quit my uh, six figure job. Right. Right. I'm not Mm going to do that because (laughs) I'm dissatisfied. I said, what can I do to start changing my life right now? And I said, I can change how people, address me because I was so successful at my job at Vibe Magazine, they had started calling me Beverly Smith from Vibe Magazine. That was my name. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I said, no, I don't want to do that anymore because one day I'm going to leave Vibe Magazine and one day I'm going to do something different. And I don't want my name to be so closely connected to an enterprise that really has nothing to do with me. It's not something I own. Mm -hmm. So I said, I'm going to change my name to Bevy because Bevy is a bevy of abundance much, you know, so <laughs> I was like, baby. that's me. Tell us, baby. <laughs> much. I'll take that. So I became Bevy Smith. <laughs> Well, you know, the beauty of that story is, like I said, I, I, I experienced it. And, you know, and the, the early part of it is when people start accepting it, because there's a group of people that will accept it. And then some people will tease you and kind of remind you like they have something to, over your head or well, I know who you really are. Yeah. But, yeah. But, the, the, but the big part about it was, you know, my whole life. And this is where we relate a lot is that and this is with anybody. You told you're raised by a parent, if you two parents, if you're fortunate, and you go to middle school, high school, you're told how to walk, talk, you make decisions, you you may go to college if you're fortunate. All the decisions, a lot of those decisions are being made by somebody else. They're shaping you. And so when you have a personality, like I have a person, like what, like Bevy has a personality, it's not normal. Her personality is not normal because it was screaming to say something different, to say something like my degree is in mathematics. And so, oh, I got a degree to make, but I was screaming like, like, like your career was in fashion and vibe yeah. and Rolling Stone. So and that's what I said was later. But you were screaming to say, yes, I'm successful. Yes, I'm achieving. I work for IBM. But I was screaming saying that's not what I want to do for the rest of my life. Yeah. And that voice, talk, tell us about that little voice, because I heard that voice in my body and I ran from it. I was afraid to tell people about it. And when I finally made the decision that this is who I was going to be, it brought me to tears because I was for the first time being honest in my life. And that's why I love your book, Revelations, because it's about being honest. And you're asking any reader who reads your book to be honest about yourselves. When you start reading the book, when you walk away from it in the end, there will be changes because for the first time, you have basically a blueprint on somebody who's telling her story, unapologetic life, that in comparison is very similar to yours. Yeah. So I'm hoping to um, challenge people to look inside, Mm -hmm. to really kind of excavate um, what they really want in life. Um, As you mentioned, Oftentimes, especially if we're successful, yes. um, as black people especially, we feel very guilty about being successful in, in our careers and then um, wanting to do something different. 
because we we know from whence we came. Right. And even the most affluent black person is traditionally only maybe two, if they're blessed, four generations away from poverty, right? Mm-hmm. You mm-hmm. know, like, you know, traditionally, you know, our parents are come through Jim Crow South. You know, my parents were, they actually knew slaves, my, mm-hmm. my grandparents, mm-hmm. you know, um, you know, so we're not that far removed. So when we start to become successful, we find ourselves feeling very guilty about saying, I don't want this because who are we? You know, there, there's that whole meme that goes around on social media. I am my um, my uh, my my ancestors wildest dreams. And I'm sure when I was Beverly Smith, fashion advertising, making a great six figure salary and traveling all over the world, my Grandparents could never have imagined that. These were people who were born in the 1800s. How could they imagine that their granddaughter would have all of this latitude and have all this luxury and have all these, um, you know, and have actually a staff that looked up to her? You know how Oprah always says, <laughs> her grandmother said, one day you're going to, you know, find yourself some good white people to work for. And Oprah said, oh, well, grandma, now I found actually good white people to work for me. Right. So I think we all battle that. Mm -hmm. But I think that in my book, which is meant to be a self-help book, I really stress to you that if you have a dream, if you have a passion that's inside of you, even though you're really successful at your current job, your career, what have you, you owe it to yourself to explore that. You have to. And it doesn't mean and I never tell people to do what I did, which is I quit my job totally. Mm -hmm. I quit a job at Rolling Stone magazine where I was making $350,000 a year and I quit. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm not advising anyone to do that. That's a very hard thing to do. And then that's an extreme thing to do. That's what I need to do for myself. But for you, it could be just as simple as actually honing in on that passion. You know, how many of us are amazing home cooks? My sister is a great home cook. Guess what she did? She started up her own catering business. Miss Lolly's Kitchen, and it's doing really well. <laughs> mm-hmm. I have another friend who actually shot the cover of my, my book. Mm-hmm. He is a music industry executive, has nothing to do with photography, but he was taking his classes, he was doing so well, and I said, well, would, you, would you actually take the photo for my book? And I gave him an opportunity, and my publisher paid him for that. Wow. You know, so we, we but the thing is, if we don't ever even try to follow our dreams and to chase our passions, we will never, ever know if we can actually do them. Well, we will it, never know. I, so it's uh, very imperative. I know you're successful. I know you're doing the damn thing. I know everyone loves you in that position. <laughs> I remember when I quit Rolling Stone, my boss said to me, you can't quit. You're in line to be, uh, you know, a publisher. You could actually run this magazine one day. And I was like, Oh, yeah, I know I can, but that's not what I want to do. Mm-hmm. I want to do all these other creative things. I want to be a writer. Right. I want to be a TV personality. I want to act. I want to sing. I want to dance. I want to do all these creative things. I want to paint. I want to study art and architecture. And guess what, Rashawn? I'm doing all those things now. I so know. It's a blessing. You do have to tell me because, I, like I told you, our stories cross so many times, you know, and 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 and, I, and, I, and, I, and I'm sure it crosses a lot of people who are going to read this book and people who are looking for direction. And I tell you this, you know, you know, it's not a dollar value because I remember when I was writing on Jamie Foxx show and I went to Warner Brothers and I said, "Can you let me out of the contract?" I was making money. Yeah. But I wanted to go a different direction in my career. It wasn't nothing to do with uh, Bentley Evers, who was a good friend of mine today, or Jamie Foxx. It was at that point in my career I wanted to do something different. I wanted to, I wanted to, making that decision eventually led me to managing Steve Harvey, because you know that move right there I went over to the Parkers, and I was right known as a consulting producer, which gave me time to start managing Steve, and we got a deal to do the morning show in 2000, and basically the rest is history, you know, Family Feud, the three books, the two movies, and we all of and he has a career that he'll never look back on, and, and I have a career that I don't look back on. But it's yeah. the decision you make, and that's like, and, I, and that reason I bring that up is that you know money holds a lot of people hostage. Yeah. 
It Amen. holds them hostage from their dreams, holds them hostage from their opportunities. So Sean, I, have, I have to stop you for a moment because I, this is something that's really pertinent. Mm -hmm. Right before I decided to quit Rolling Stone, I mm -hmm. also had an opportunity to buy a brownstone in Harlem. Yes, ma'am. Now, for anyone who doesn't understand what that means, is that I had an opportunity at that time to buy a brownstone that would have been two hundred and fifty thousand mm -hmm. dollars. Um, which that brownstone now probably goes for $1.5 million mm -hmm. in the 15 year span. That's how much the property values have risen. But if I had bought that brownstone with Sean, I could not have also quit my job. Right. And I would have been beholden to the job so that I could maintain that lifestyle of that brownstone. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people do not understand, which is what you were alluding to. They do not understand that sometimes your money and your possessions can become a gilded cage. It can become an albatross right around your neck. And you have to be careful about that. You know, in my book, I write a chapter called Broke But Blissful. Yes. And so many people are outraged about that chapter because they're just like, I can't believe you went from $350,000 a year to $35,000 a year. Mm -hmm. And I tell them all the time, I did that because I knew that it was a temporary moment. Mm -hmm. Trouble don't last always. Mm -hmm. I knew I could make more money. Yes. But what I knew also is that if I kept on that same path of being a fashion advertising director, I would have made a lot of money and been incredibly miserable. And what kind of life is that? That's it's, not a life worth living to me. Well, I, I would tell you this. Your life in this book is, has been ahead of the time. I want to I want to go into a couple of areas of the book that I thought that just stood out. The essence culture versus the vibe culture. Yeah. And that's important because time periods dictate how people react to you. Like you said, mm -hmm. you know, I was 10 years earlier, 10, or 10 years too early when I walked into Essence with the look that you were, had at that point. Now, that that look would work. It was it was dynamic. Talk about the Essence culture and the Vibe culture, because you had an opportunity to go to Essence and you chose yeah. Vibe. Yes. Yeah, I had an opportunity to go to Essence Magazine, the, uh, the grand dame of Essence Magazine, Susan mm -hmm. Taylor, who is an iconic woman and who's such a great gift and, and a woman who doesn't judge other women. She she met with me and she thought I was terrific. And she said, you know what? I think there's a position here for you. Go and meet with my my uh, advertising team. And when I met with them, I realized that everyone was in like really business women suits, you know, mm -hmm. like everyone had like, you know, collars up to here. And <laughs> they were wearing suits. They weren't wearing that, you know, that their makeup was very subdued and understated. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, yeah, I just left a white, an all white environment where I didn't feel my most natural bevy ass self. Mm -hmm. I don't want to go into a black environment and not feel my most bevy ass self. <laughs> and so I, I declined that that um, offer. Mm -hmm. And then a couple of months later, I got an offer to be at Vibe magazine. Mm -hmm. And when I walked in Vibe, I said, oh, this is my jam right here. Mm -hmm. See, I'm, I'm the first generation of hip hop. And I'm mm -hmm. born and raised in New York. So hip hop is my thing. And in the book, as you know, Rashawn, mm -hmm. I talk about being Big Bad from Uptown. Yes. I'm friends with Tupac and Biggie and, you know, Puff. And I, I'm in the scene. I'm on the scene. Right. And so right. hip hop is my natural habitat. Right, right. And so when I walk into Vibe, they get my fly girl look. Mm -hmm. They get my big earrings. Mm -hmm. They get that I'm showing some cleavage and I'm still going to take care of business. Right. You know what I mean? So it was a really good fit. So sometimes, you know, you have to look at a corporate culture and know whether or not it's worth it to you to contort yourself and to do things that don't feel necessarily natural to you. Is it worth it? When I went to Rolling Stone, totally different corporate culture. Again, right back into an all white situation. Right. But I went up in Rolling Stone with a real reason. As you know, Rashawn, I talk about I went to Rolling Stone knowing that I was going to quit right. as soon as I got my bonus check. Absolutely. Absolutely. I was going to do a hot 10 months up in there. <laughs> and as soon as they gave me my bonus check, right. I was going to be like, child for now. Well, you know, the thing about it in that moment, if you just the vibe Rolling Stones moment that you had because you didn't really expect to go to Rolling Stone. You was using Rolling Stone as a stepping stone and then Vibe said, uh, uh, you know. No, uh, no, Vibe was first and then it was Rolling Stone. I mean, right, it was Vibe. It was, I apologize. It was Rolling Stone because you went to Rolling Stone, picked up an offer and then you took it back over to Vibe and then yes. Vibe said, oh, wow, good luck. 
Good luck. Good luck. And so, and so, and you were ready for that. You, you were caught off guard, but it didn't slow down your momentum. Nah. And so that's why I just love the whole process is that do not, and I talk about it in my intro, do not allow people to control your destiny. Write your own story and you continually write your own story. And yeah. I, I, and I want to ask you uh, one thing, Bevy, because I'm talking to Bevy Smith, uh, author of a tremendous book that I want to recommend to everybody called Bevy Relations. It's her memoir by learning to live a big, authentic, and unapologetic life, and how you can too. One of the most fulfilling speaking events was your tour of HBCUs. Yes. I, I talk about HBCUs. I, I did not attend one, but I'm a big proponent. I, I promote it. I uh, amplify HBCUs equal black excellence. Tell us about how impactful that tour was that your girlfriend from Boost hooked you up with as the sponsor, HBCU College Tour. Yeah. You know, I also went to a PWI. You know, I went to New York University mm -hmm. where I did not graduate because I was already in my career. Mm -hmm. And so my boss was like, well, you can actually teach the course. And now you're miss missing out on big presentations and meetings. You know, the rubber hit, hit the road. <laughs> so I actually left mm -hmm. um, with probably only a year left to get my degree. Mm -hmm. But it didn't stop me. But I always tell people it's one thing to drop out of a, a prestigious school like NYU and another thing to drop out of a, you know, a, a, a school, the Trump University. Let's put it that way. <laughs> right, right, right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, I, like you, am a very big fan of um, HBCUs. And so when I had the opportunity to go and speak, um, it was a Boost Mobile tour. It was really an amazing moment for me because it was my first ever speaking engagement. Um, and so I learned a lot. I was on a panel with people who did a lot of public speaking. Mm -hmm. And what I realized is that they had very rote, very scripted kind of things that they would talk about. And every stop would be the same line. So from Morehouse to Howard, from, you know, Pam, you to, you know, uh, uh, Morris Brown, they would say the same kind of things. Right. And um, I also realized that they were giving people a highlights reel. And I said, oh, yeah, that's not going to help the kids giving them a highlights reel. We need to let them know about the real challenges that they will face in the workplace. Mm -hmm. Being black, mm -hmm. going into corporate America, mm -hmm. what can they expect and how can they uh, how can they navigate these issues? Mm -hmm. And so that's when I decided to come really clean. I started telling people about my most authentic self. And in the book, I talk about, you know, finding out three things. And this is how you develop your own personal brand. Who are you at your core? How are you being perceived? How would you like to be perceived? If you can answer those three questions really honestly, and that's where the introspective work comes in that, if you can answer those questions, you can develop a personal brand. And once you develop your personal brand, I have a chapter called Brand You, mm -hmm. and that talks about how you can maximize and actually sell people into your personal brand, have them buy into it. And that's what I was able to do on that tour. But I gotta tell you, you know, Rashawn, um, as I've mentioned several times just in this interview, I'm from Harlem. And when I was um, in these all white environments, mm -hmm. especially when um, I was a kid in the 80s as an advertising receptionist, um, people were horrified that I lived in Harlem. And they would say things like, are you safe? Don't you want to move? And things like that. And when I would go over to Europe, I would always tell people I was from Harlem versus saying I'm from Manhattan. Harlem is a neighborhood in Manhattan, so mm -hmm. I could have easily said I'm from Manhattan, and that mm -hmm. that means everything, you know. Right. Manhattan is what you see when you think of New York City. Mm -hmm. You really only think of Manhattan, mm -hmm. and now Brooklyn, but really Manhattan, right? And so I could have said that, but I chose to always lead with Harlem. And can I just tell you something from being authentic mm -hmm. about my brand and about who I am and where I'm from? Mm -hmm. I have made so much money from Harlem from being from Harlem. Because now all these big brands come into Harlem and they want an authentic voice. <laughs> and they want someone who is recognized, recognizable from a national point of view, mm -hmm. but someone who is very locally um, connected. And there I am. So I learned doing that on that HBCU tour. Mm -hmm. I, I learned to be my most authentic self and not to hide these things. That's even the reason why I put in the book that I didn't graduate from NYU. I thought it was important to put that in there. Mm -hmm. 
you know? So, yeah, it's the authenticity is what wins for me. Well, um, I'm talking to Beverly Smith. She's uh, She's been booked, she's blessed, and she's busty. But more importantly, <laughs> she has a fantastic book called Bevelations. You can hear her on Sears XM Bevelations on Radio Andy. Uh, Beverly Smith, I want to thank you for coming on Money Making Conversations. Thank you so much, my love. It's been a joy. It's been really great chatting with you. And I'm so happy that we finally met after all these years. Absolutely. You know, the beauty of you is that uh, I, I know this won't be the last time we're going to talk. But secondly, our lives are so relatable and I feel a kinship towards you. And mm-hmm. I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a, the blessings that have happened in my life are being received in your book. And so it's my responsibility to promote your book and, and get it into the hands of as many people as possible. Again, thank you for coming on Money Making Conversations, Miss Bev. Smith. Thank you, Rashawn. It's been my pleasure, my love. Cool. If you want to hear more Money Making Conversations interviews, please go to moneymakingconversation.com. I'm Rashawn McDonald. I am your host.